Good evening and thank you for joining us. A big step was taken today towards the creation of Thunder Bay's new waterfront art gallery. Local contractor Tom Jones Corporation has been announced as the construction manager for the project and the work at the site near Prince Arthur's Landing is expected to begin in the coming weeks. The facility is expected to open in 2025. Basilios Bellows reports. It feels like now people will be able to see that this is a reality, including all of us who've been working on the project. It's a cause for excitement in Thunder Bay as a contractor has been chosen to work on the Waterfront Art Gallery. Local group Tom Jones Corporation will be taking on the job as construction manager with site and foundation work set to begin shortly. The construction budget is $38 million and the plan is to have the art gallery open to the public sometime in 2025. Art Gallery Director Sharon Godwin says the path to this announcement wasn't an easy one, making it even more special. You know, we started initially in 2009 and really ramped up in 2012. We've had some bumps along the way, um, you know, a pandemic and a lot of environmental investigations. Um, raising money, you know, we've spent a lot of time uh, securing funds for the building and we still have a little more of that to do, but um, so it is gratifying. The project has already received funding from all levels of government including another $20 million from the feds announced last summer. For those looking to help out, a community fundraising campaign will also kick off in the spring to hopefully cover the remaining cost. It wasn't the only big announcement from the art gallery as Godwin revealed that after more than 40 years of service, she'll be stepping down as executive director in June, instead taking on the role as the Waterfront Gallery project lead. Because I'm so familiar with the project, um, rather than have a new person try to absorb all of this, um, I guess it just makes sense for me to continue and continue dealing with funders and all of those intricacies that are behind the scenes that um, are things that I already work on. Tom Jones, President Parker Jones, says that there should be some initial activity at the site along the Tugboat Basin in the next couple of weeks. Vasilios Bellows, TBT News. After a record breaking of numbers of murders last year, Thunder Bay now has its first homicide of 2023. A Hamilton teen has been arrested in connection to a fatal shooting on John Street yesterday. Detective Inspector Jeremy Pearson provided details on the tragic incident at a news conference this afternoon. Mitchell Ringos was there. Just after 3.30 p.m. on uh, Sunday, January 22nd, where our, uh, our police services primary response officers responded uh, to a call for assistance and there discovered a, uh, a male in medical distress, quickly determined that this was in fact a, uh, a weapons, a firearm incident and began uh, attempting both to uh, render assistance to the victim, to identify witnesses as well as contain the area and begin the search for a suspect. The shooting occurred at this townhouse on the 700 block of John Street. City police managed to arrest a 17-year-old male from Hamilton just after midnight on Monday and charged him with second-degree murder. The suspect cannot be named under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. He remains in police custody and made an appearance in bail court. Pearson says he believes the police response in this case was effective, timely and overall successful. I'm very proud of the work that all officers involved did in this instance and uh, while this is a, a shocking and uh, an unfortunate and a tragic event, uh, the police response is something in which I hope the community takes solace. The victim, 23-year-old Dallas Bannon of Thunder Bay, was pronounced deceased at the hospital just before 9 p.m. on Sunday. Pearson could not speak about the motives behind this tragic incident but did say at this current time they do not believe the drug trade was involved. The investigation into this homicide, into this incident, does not suggest a link between this act of violence and the illicit drug trade. Uh, in terms of any of the surrounding circumstances that may be uh, part and parcel of the history of all individuals involved, that remains part of the ongoing investigation. Pearson says the scene will be held as the investigation continues and that a post-mortem examination will be conducted on Wednesday in Toronto. Mitchell Ringo's TBT News. 
A local man has been charged with the possession of child pornography. 62-year-old Grant Wilkie was arrested on Friday after Thunder Bay police found incriminating images on electronic devices that were seized from a home on Frankwood Avenue two weeks earlier. Wilkie appeared in bail court on Friday and has been released with conditions. A local school bus driver has been charged with failing to stop for a red light following a two-vehicle crash Friday afternoon on the city's north side. The school bus, with 19 children on board, collided with a small car at the corner of High Street in Van Norman just before 3 o'clock. Eyewitnesses indicate that none of the kids on the bus were hurt, and Thunder Bay police say also no serious injuries were reported. But the car sustained significant damage. The school bus was headed west on Van Norman when the collision occurred, and police confirmed today that the bus driver has been charged with a red light violation. City Council has a light agenda for tonight's meeting. One, items, one item of note surrounds election accessibility. A report will come forward providing an overview of the city's efforts during the recent municipal election to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to vote as independently as possible. Things like voting locations, methods and access to information will all be reviewed. The plan is to use the report to help remove any remaining barriers and improve inclusivity at the polls for Thunder Bay's 2026 municipal election. There's more backlash against the Ford government's handling of the housing file. Dozens of people took to the streets today in protest of the province's plan to develop protected lands. Siobhan Morris has the story. Save the green belt. From those who've been around a while. He said he was not going to touch it. And now he's definitely touching it. To those new to activism. I want to help uh, let people know that it's not just their future, it's ours. Dozens of protesters made noise outside a conference of rural municipalities. This group is angry with the move to allow development on 15 plots of land pulled from the Greenbelt. Inside, the government stressed the need to build more homes as more people choose Ontario to build a life. Ontario is in a housing supply crisis, and Ontarians expect us to act. You just can't keep saying, not in my backyard. My neighbour doesn't want it, we don't want it. Where are we going to put these people? Outside, protesters reject that approach. The biggest housing crisis concerns people who would not be able to afford to buy the Mick mansions that are going to be built in the Green Belt. The Green Party leader says the decision is all wrong. To pave over the farmland that feeds us, the wetlands and the green space that clean our drinking water and protect us from flooding so a handful of land speculators can cash in and the rest of us are going to pay the price. While the government has dug in on the Green Belt change, the opposition sees opportunity to change minds. We saw this fall uh, that when we all come together, we can get the government to reverse course, right? They backed off of their attack on education workers, so we can make that happen here too. There's hope too among the demonstrators. I mean, it's happening all over Ontario. It's a, a broad-based, multi-party uh, objection to these kinds of decisions. The longtime president of the Lakehead Transportation Museum Society is going public with his split from the group he helped form in 2016. Charlie Brown says a decision to part ways could lead to the Brill trolley buses being moved to another location. The internal conflicts between Brown and the rest of the board have been brewing over the past year. This internal fighting is not the, not the way I wanted to go, but it is what it is right now. Maybe we can work that out. I'm still more than happy to sit down with people and discuss things and, uh, and look for new options uh, if, if people want to do that. But I can't do anything if people won't come to the table. Brown was the driving force behind the return of the Alexander Henry Icebreaker to the lakehead in 2017. It's now a popular museum ship at the Pool 6 dock. Brown is also the longtime president of the Buddies of the Brill, which restored a pair of vintage transit buses. They were finally moved to the LTMS site in 2021. Brown's resignation from the Museum Society prompted him to seek a new agreement, in which the Brill bus group would receive 10% of all ticket sales at the Transportation Museum. That deal was apparently rejected, so Brown now plans to relocate the buses. Looks like we're going to have to remove them off the property and uh, have to make some arrangements with the LTMS. 
You know, uh, this is a sad thing uh, that we're doing today, and we did have an opportunity. We gave them an opportunity and a proposal that would have resolved this, doubled the operation here, made things really positive, and it just didn't work out that way. A spokesperson for the Transportation Museum Society says it's an unfortunate situation, but says the board is in solidarity as it aims to build goodwill with its many stakeholders. There's no word on any planned negotiations about the future of the Brill buses. Plans are underway for a new bar located in the Waterfront District that will change the way people look at a night out on the town. Owner Jody Luce is creating the first ever dry bar in the city. When it opens, it will offer a safe, fun nightclub experience for those recovering from addiction. This space is going to be a place for people to come and uh, socialize, uh, mingle, network, dance, sing karaoke, take in comedy shows, fashion shows, uh, anything that would happen in a you know, really popular bar setting. But uh, this is going to happen in a setting that's uh, conducive to no alcohol sales. And uh, I think Thunder Bay is ready for that, and uh, I'm really, really excited to bring it. The Howl at the Moon Dry Saloon and Late Night Coffee Bar will be located on Cumberland Street South. Loose Plant calls it his passion project. As a bartender for the past 25 years, he's seen just how many people deal with addiction. And after previously struggling, struggling with sobriety himself, he decided he wanted to be part of the solution. In addition to the regular bar amenities, there will also be a resource center in the back for those who need help. There's uh, definitely a shortage of resources, so I feel like this project is going to uh, serve a purpose inside the community and help a lot of people. Uh, this is a passion project for me. You know, I, I've lost friends and family to addiction, and uh, you know, I want to give people a safe space to come and relax and have a great time where they don't have to worry about uh, triggers and they can uh, focus on healing. Renovation work has just begun. Lou says his goal is to have the dry saloon open to the public by March 31st. The month of January is typically the busiest month of the year for gyms, as many people buy memberships as part of their New Year's resolution. But with COVID variants spreading over the past two years, this is the first January since 2020 where local fitness centres have been able to operate without any lockdowns or restrictions. Mike Lang has more. January weather, the holidays being long over and no more shutdowns means that busy gym floors are once again a common sight in local fitness centres. The Canada Games Complex now regularly has dozens of members training in their workout areas during the late afternoon rush hour and another handful of walkers and runners using their track. Program supervisor Jesse Bogaki says they have seen plenty of new members so far in the new year and that the traffic at the complex is similar to how it was before the pandemic. We've definitely seen a lot of the older members come back. Um, it's been really nice to get our chronic disease management programs up and running. Yeah, I've seen some faces I haven't seen in a long time. I said, it's, you know, it's been a while to somebody the other day. And they said, yeah, I haven't been here in three years. So it's, it's super nice to see those uh, faces that, you know, I really haven't had the chance to check in with and talk to. It's a similar situation at Push Fitness on Fort William Road. The main gym floor is just as busy after four o'clock and personal trainers have a more regular in-person clientele. Whether you want to call it New Year's resolutions or whether it's just the first month that the weather's turned cold enough to come inside, it was something that completely was abolished over the past couple of years. So this year it's been a real surge of people returning or coming, brand new people that have never committed to fitness before. Bizignano is also grateful to have 10 plus participants in her spin class as group fitness classes have been able to operate at full capacity. Along those lines, she greatly missed the social aspect of working out during the pandemic, and she says that members are more likely to return to the gym when they are motivated by the people around them. I'm feeling pretty happy that people have still been, been flooding the brick and mortar facilities, and again, it's because we don't necessarily like exercising alone. Even if you're not socializing with the people around you when you're at the gym, it just feels good to have people that are like-minded with a common goal surrounding you and just kind of helping feed your energy and, and, and know that what you're doing is a good thing. Bizignano adds that strong membership engagement is especially important to privately owned gyms. Word of mouth is what allowed Push Fitness to survive the lockdowns and what will allow them to celebrate their 20th anniversary in February. And now with no more worries about restrictions or lockdowns, local gyms could go back to focusing exclusively on helping their members achieve their fitness goals by making the gym home away from home once again. Mike Lang, TBT News.
Mike's been looking for an excuse to pump some iron on 100%. camera for months now. Since he uh, got here, for glad, sure. glad he finally got that opportunity. Well, Fiona, it was a bit of a cold night overnight last night. Yes, uh, we we're back to seasonal temperatures or very close to it overnight. A low of minus 17, wind chills of minus 24. But today uh, we rebounded beautifully back up to a high of minus two, wind chills of minus eight, and that's with a real mixed bag of sky conditions. It was mostly cloudy. We had a little bit of sunshine peeking out. We had periods of uh, light dustings of snow, and winds were, for the most part, from the west all the way down from eight kilometers per hour, and then in the afternoon kicked up a notch, hitting gusts up to 32 kilometers an hour. Now, if we take a look at what's going on across the region, uh, kind of a mixed bag there as well. Fort Francis has seen the temperatures rise all day. They're currently at a high of minus three and a wind chill of minus seven. That's with some light snow. Cooler as you head up into Kenora and Dryden, they're at minus seven. Red Lake has seen temperatures drop steadily all day. They're currently at their low for the day of minus 11 and a wind chill of minus 18, but they too have uh, got some snow showers going on there. Little warmer as you head into Sioux Lookout and Armstrong at minus eight and minus nine at Celsius. Minus six in Greenstone. They've had snow since about noon today and wind chills are currently sitting around minus 13. Uh, Marathon, Nipigon all along uh, the North Shore at about minus four at this hour. And Sault Ste. Marie, minus three Celsius. Uh, they've had a clouds all afternoon. It just started snowing again there and uh, wind chills are currently feeling like minus nine and they've got a lot of snow heading their way tonight. Here in the city of Thunder Bay we are going to drop down to a low of minus 15 and wind chills of minus 18. That's about four or five degrees above normal for this time of year and that will be under uh, mainly cloudy skies with winds from the north northwest nine to twenty four kilometers per hour as we head into Tuesday it's looking to be pretty dry uh, for most of northwestern Ontario but there is another potential for snow showers later on in the week and I'll have more details on when that will arrive later on in the news hour. Okay thanks a lot Fiona. Well, mass shootings have become an all too familiar story in the United States and today an 11th person has died stemming from that shooting on Saturday in California at a Lunar New Year celebration. We'll have all the details for you as your Monday news hour continues. I needed to take this weapon, disarm him or else everybody would have died.